titled Racism in Print and Non-Print Media. Today we're going to deal with racism in literature, taking a look at 20th century African American literature. Uh, how racism has impacted upon the creation of the literature, how it has impacted upon the people who write the literature, and the distribution of the literature as well. This program is being made possible in part by support from the New York Council for the Humanities, as well as possible with support from Poets and Writers, which is funded by the Literature Program of the New York State Council on the Arts. The sponsors within our institution are the Office of the President, Library Services Division, specifically the Library Black History Month Committee, and the Student Government Association, as well as our Humanities Division. To bring you an introduction of the topic for tonight, as well as to introduce you to our panelists, is one of our longtime faculty members, who himself is a writer and publisher. I would like to introduce you to, if you don't already know him, Professor Steve Cannon from our Humanities Division, English Department. Professor Cannon. Cannon. Interpret and paraphrase our topic 
tonight because John O. Killens, who was mentor to a few of us around this table, and I also am teaching the workshop here at Mega Rivers that John taught before he died. Um, the black man's burden, because that's what we are running into in white media. Um, the preconceptions, the stereotype handed down in the publishing industry from generation to generation, those stereotypes make decisions in sales meetings as to printings, number of copies, and promotion. And that is what we're not getting. Now, one of our problems that I want to speak about first, which is our responsibility, is because, because the media does not historically promote black books, particularly first novels, our literary community and our readers are going to have to make it their business because we have to work a little harder just as the black writer um, in all media has to work twice as hard to get half as far. We're going to have to work a little harder to make ourselves aware of our books, of our work that's out here. Recently, I think, yeah, last year, I did a book review of a woman called Marita Bonner. I had never heard of Marita Bonner. Has anyone in the audience? Would you just raise your hand? I'm just curious. Marita Bonner came out at, along at the same time that Langston Hughes and them were out here. She was very heavy. She studied with them. But no one had ever heard of her. I certainly hadn't. And her life work is now published. And it just irked me so when I was asked to review it and realized that not only had I not heard of it, but when I asked my peers, no one else had ever heard of her. You know, that is, it's, it's like the neglect that we suffer, it affects us financially, and when it does affect us financially, that means that we write slower. Because the one thing that it does take to write is time. When I just recently came back from Wayne State University as the Martin Luther King, Rosa Parks, Cesar Chavez Distinguished <laughs> Visiting Professor. How's that for an hour? All right. Okay, I was out there for two weeks. The state of Michigan instituted this program for a sort of interracial literary enlightenment. So it, it, the money is given to university to be dispensed to the visitors. They were my hosts. What happened was I was met at the airport on Wednesday evening and put in an apartment on campus without a telephone and left there. And left there. The disrespect, I believe the young folks today call it dissed. Well, I was dissed. The disrespect with which I was treated had to do with the color of the program. Um, it was unfortunate, but a very enthusiastic young black journalist, journalism major, did this scathing but wonderful story in Wayne State University's paper. And I was very glad that I was leaving the post when it came out. He was much more enthusiastic than I had kind of anticipated. But what we want to do in addressing these publishers. And I want to say something for Thunder's Mouth Press because we have two, two black publishers and distributors here on, on the stage, Afro-American, okay? We, we, Thunder's Mouth Press is reissuing some titles that have been out of print and we should be very interested in them. There's um, Chester Hines, John A. Williams, John Killen's work. Um, I'm not sure who else, Zora Neal. Yeah, they're, they're just doing wonderful things, and um, Mega Rivers Bookstore is going to have them in the bookstore because we talked Saturday. Um, I guess what I want mostly is to, to make us aware of our responsibility because we this, it is only the squeaky wheel that gets oiled. Racism is a fact and has been a fact of our existence, at least since I was born, and I was born before most of you. And we are going to... Hmm? Oh, except Steve, um, old Professor Cannon here. <laughs> I do want to also say that there have been, we have fought, we are fighting for 
or visibility. Visibility means that someone in Detroit will know about a book that was released in New York in November and December, and someone in New York will know about a book released in California. This kind of networking is something that just doesn't happen. We have a black book club, Noreen Dunneville. It's, um, am I correct, in Pennsylvania? Oh, Jersey, New Jersey, it's, it's in New Jersey. But there are, there are ways to acquire bibliographies and to read ourselves rather than the strap hanging that we all see, um, because we seem to have a large love for Danielle Steele, I don't know why, um, too much of it. <laughs> Publishers, we, that is an indictment of ourselves, you know. Um, we have too many, too many black writers and publishers walking around working to present our story to ourselves and to each other to neglect ourselves so shamefully. I am not talking about don't read white books. I am saying make black literature part of your reading schedule. This week's Publishers Weekly has a most interesting um, five-page spread on black writers. Um, in it, you'll find the Harlem Writers Guild, the Renaissance Writers Guild, and black writers straight across the country, and their thoughts and opinions. And I didn't expect this, um, this broad a layout. I am going to Xerox this because it's not sold on stands. I am going to Xerox it and make sure that there are copies in the humanities department um, next week for any of you who might want to read it. But it, does, it says precisely what we're here to talk about tonight, which is racism in media and what happens to our works and how it falls through the cracks. Because this is Black History Month, and I know I'm not demeaning Black History Month. It is a wonderful thing for most of us because that is the one month that I'm positive that I can pay my rent and kind of do the telephone bill. But I, I'm getting this suspicion that if this is Black History Month, then the other 11 are White History Month. That is beginning to bother me, you know, because I had, I actually had a State University of New York send me an invitation already to be their guest in Black History Month in 1990. In 1990, there are exactly 12 months before that, and the soonest that they could use my contribution is February 1990. So if we, if we can get together and seek out, I guess we're, and it's going to have to be our responsibility until there's more equity, equity than there is now. But until we can get that equity, we're going to have to stay close in touch with one another. We're going to have to check out black theater. We're going to have to check out our own institutions. And we're going to have to support our own bookstores. And not accept so easily uh, the out of print, the we don't have a copy, because I think um, most bookstores, most bookstores can be kind of intimidated into ordering for you. You know, I stop in bookstores as a matter of course and order black books um, because they never order one; they order five or six. They'll put it back on the shelf because one of our main problems is not initial order; it's pre-order. Once a bookstore manager or these chains have ordered a black book. They don't see any reason to reorder it unless they're coerced, unless it's brought to their attention. I remember Bruce Wright's book, oh, um, Black Robes, White Justice, which they kept printing 2,000 at a time. That is such an insulting printing for a national audience. And they kept having, I am pleased to say, to reissue a new printing because it went just as fast as they could do it. And I had a man, a manager in Barnes & Noble on Fifth Avenue in the 50s, no, in the 40s, tell me that not only did he not have the book, he had no intention of ordering the book. And I asked him for the name of the manager and the head of his fiction buying process right there. And I did write her, and I got some very influential white folks who I knew that they would listen to better to write, to write and find out why. And, and that's what we're going to have to do. And thank you. Thank you very much.
much. And Doris, you know, son, uh, forgive me for making such a blunder. <laughs> I apologize. Next we have Louis Ray's reviewer, poet, and publisher of small books. Thank you. <clears throat> the general statement that guides us today is how racism affects African American literature in the 20th century. I will focus on an historical overview of what that literature comprises. And I will expound upon several of the words used and implied within the given parameters. The fact that I feel compelled to use my allotted time to focus on the language we are using is itself a testament to the effects of racism on us and on our literature. One, because too many of our younger writers are not studying enough, which dulls their senses of perspective. And two, because the first spasmic reaction that comes inside the attitude of the racist is to deny us our humanity. To him, we ain't even human, and consequently, like the ox, the sheep, and the chimp, we are not subject to being respected as such. His adamance in this refusal is at the very core of African American literature, hanging side by side with both the fact that we're the ones who've done all the hard work that went into building and cultivating this entire hemisphere, in addition to what it means when we say freedom. The word that I would wish to qualify first is racism. Understand, however, that I do so with the assumption that every single human being has, by virtue of birth, the right and the responsibility and the compulsion excuse me, to eat well, to know exactly what preceded us, and to develop to our fullest capacities. We are engaged in a relentless struggle over that right and responsibility and compulsion which struggle will continue relentlessly until every single child knows exactly how to read. It naturally follows then that the writer bears with the legitimate necessity to contribute to our ongoing search for even more clarity. For that is the basis and the reason for all literature, for every line and utterance in the scripture word. The degrees to which we each meet that necessity can be sifted through in the works that we produce. The degrees to which we each fail to meet that necessity will always come out in our wash. Racism is not an ideology. There is no scientific or logical basis through which it may be rationalized. It is a diseased attitude that stands against humanity and therefore stands against life itself. Like all attitudes, it is ingrained into each of us as part of our socializational processes. Like insular provincialism, like tribalism, racism exists as an attitudinal excuse for the continued exploitation of land, labor, and leg. No one and nothing escapes the disease. The second term I wish to qualify is African. Here we get caught in a dubious complicity with our exploiters. Too many of us in this country don't acknowledge the legitimacy of the term as we use it, opting instead for black with an uppercase B, which term has no land base and therefore no real politic that would bind the nations of the world to embrace us. Consequently, we are politically disowned by the rest of the world. Some of us, however, cling to the term African in an unusually romantic and repatriationistic way, sometimes to the point of losing sight of the fact that the vast majority of us here are here to stay and no perspective that ignores the political needs inherent with that fact can ever be considered genuinely wholesome. Except, of course, to an intellectual minority who find psychological 
solace with its identification. But Africa is not a homogeneous nation. It is a heterogeneous continent. Still others look upon Africa coldly, the object of conquest and kidnapping, rape and enslavement, and consequent struggle. As subject, however, Africa is the key to the differential roots of all that we know. Our identification with it is the basis from which a planetary perspective can be made to grow. Africa is as well the home of all our literature, of our beginnings in science, astronomy, mathematics, agriculture, masonry, architecture, politics, monotheism, philosophy, and even the alphabet we use, as Hellenic as it may appear. The third term I wish to qualify is American, and for our purposes, the consequent term African-American. Both have grown in usage over the last 200 years as misnomers for the more accurate terms United States and Afro-United States. The arrogant presumption of so-called white men the alleged descendants of an Anglo-Saxon lineage has led us all down the road of distortion, whereby the hemisphere, the actual America, is not only disqualified from the adjective, but more dangerously remains at the greed-filled whim, like the rest of us, of those pseudo-Saxons who continue to exploit all of us. However, when we look with our own eyes, there are more African Americans in um, Brazil than in the United States. There are just as many African Americans in the Caribbean as in the United States, no less than 20% and 30% of the populations of Ecuador and Colombia, respectively, are African American. And all along the Caribbean side of Central America, you'll find town after port jammed filled with African Americans. In other words, in using the term African American, we should take care to fully embrace all that it implies. <coughs> but we've been tricked, whipped, chained, and trained to fully accept someone else's given through someone else's language. To use the usage of English, for example, as an American distinction, making the French, the Spanish, and Portuguese-speaking people of this hemisphere somehow different from us, is to forget that all them tongues belong to the same geopolitical oppressor. Without taking great care, we each end up being absorbed by all the nuances of our own rape. I find it interesting to note that on the one hand, we have allowed ourselves to disclaim an affinity with Simone Bolivar, whose mother was an African, and yet, because of a more direct proximity, we willingly and openly embrace Malcolm X, whose mother comes from Grenada, which country suffered 300 years of Spanish rule before the British took it. As this relates to African-American literature, culture, and politics, we cannot ignore, disclaim, or exclude the works of Claude McKay, Amy Césaire, Luis Pales Matos, Marcus Garvey, Arturo Alfonso Schomburg, or more contemporarily, Nicolas Guillén, Miguel Pinheiro, Walter Rodney, Dr. Joseph Ben Jacquinen, Ivan Van Sertema, Cheryl Byron, Tato Laviera, Sandra Maria Esteves, Shamsul Alam, Linton Kwesi Johnson, Dwight Phillip, Paul Larocque, George Lammings, Derek Walcott, and Mervyn Taylor, just to name but a few, simply because they do not come from the United States without cheating ourselves of the fullness of our literature. They write for us. <clears throat> we must take the greatest care not to allow insular provincialism to surround us with shallow borders, which brings us to the phrase which I would also like to qualify. African-American
second literature in the 20th century. Sterling Brown has offered us the proposition that if the European Renaissance took no less than 300 years to unfold, then our own Renaissance first could not be limited to Harlem as it was at least a nationwide movement, and second, cannot encompass a mere six-year period. We might also add that the Renaissance to which Sterling alluded corresponds exactly to the rise and development of a Caribbean-wide and West African negritude movement by way of craft, content, intent, time period, and communicative association. Them folks back then knew about each other and from time to time collaborated with one another and passed the information and the experience on. Suggested in Brown's proposition, moreover, is that a rebirth of a people's literature is an ongoing, continuous process, the continuity of which is immediately seen in the existence of literary and human bridges connecting one preceding phase and or period with the next. Accordingly, I would hold that the one word that best qualifies the entire scope of 20th century African American literature locally and hemispherically is the word renaissance, the term rebirth. The attitude that things begin and end simply because white folks and white money say they do is something we should all question within ourselves. I am personally hesitant to pin down any one specific phenomenon as a point of beginning. I bear in mind that the precursors of an African-American literature are first and foremost all those hundreds of millions of individuals who comprise a planetary-wide middle passage, what some refer to as the African diaspora, which, from the literary standpoint, would automatically bring to mind the contributions of Alexander Pushkin, the father of Russian literature, or the olive skinned complexion of D'Artagnan and all those other quote unquote swarthy looking characters swarming the pages of Alexander Dumas. His grandmother came from Haiti. Or the blackamoors of Shakespeare's plays. Or the existence of a black Jew in a white Christian country such as Spinoza. Or the descriptions of Jesus. Socrates and Moses with their lamb wool hair, or the character descriptions in the Epic of Gilgamesh, 5,000 years old, who have hair only on the tops of their heads and between their legs, or even the story of Matu or Mata, the earliest recorded Adam, who, according to the Twa people, we say pygmy, which is Jai had sprung from the trunk of a tree in the valley of the mountains of the moon, one of which is still referred to as, check out your Bibles, the throne of God, a mountain. But if there is such a thing as a beginning, I would offer that the 20th century side of an African-American literary renaissance here in the United States could be said to have begun, at least for our purposes, with the publication of W.E.B. Du Bois's The Souls of Black Folk, 1903. In it, we have the blueprint for much of what is to follow. But I hesitate to exclude from mention Paul Lawrence Dunbar, Booker T. Washington, Henry Highland Garnett, Sojourner Truth, Frederick Douglass, David Walker's Appeal, the Ethiopian Manifesto, just as I'd be hesitant to exclude Pachin Marin, that Puerto Rican New York exile who was called the Black Lord Byron, and who died along with Jose Marti during the initial battles of the Cuban Revolution back in 1895, as well as all those written and oral slave narratives popping up throughout our enslavement here 
because you see, all things precede and proceed from what is. And they each have an influence over the other. Renaissance is not just a period, but a continuous flow. Langston Hughes, County Cullen, Zora Neale Hurston, Arnavon Kent, Carter G. Woodson and Company did not stop writing or influencing or bridging the generations simply because white support backed off and the stock market crashed. There were bridges built, human bridges that continued to flow. Sterling Brown, Richard Wright, Margaret Walker, Gwendolyn Brooks, James Baldwin, John Oliver Killens, Lorraine Hansberry, John A. Williams, and Amiri Baraka, each in their turn are among those human and literary bridges whose works and influences testify to the ongoing continuity of at least a century-long unfoldment. From them hail an entire army of contemporary writers who have manifested their capacity to contribute to the national side of this literature from the 1960s straight through to the present. Among them, Sarah E. Wright, Maya Angelou, Rosa Guy, Louis, Louise Merriweather, Ted Bullins, Pee Wee Thomas, Douglas Turner Ward, Paul Marshall, Askia Touré, Larry Neal, Garland Kane, Ishmael Reed, Brenda Wilkerson, Quincy True, Jane Cortez, Alice Childress, Sonia Sanchez, Tony K. Bambara, Sekou Sundiata, Zizwe Ngafwa, Safia Henderson Holmes, Tulani Davis, Gary Johnston, they're all yours. When we add to them the litany of writers who've appeared in such anthologies as Black Fire, Giant Talk, Black and in Brooklyn, check that out, or in all those journals and magazines that have come and gone or are still here, such as Black World, Kalalu, Obsidian, Black Scholar, Black Mask or who've been individually and collectively published by our own alternatives, such as Cannon Reed and Johnson, Blind Vega Press, Potential Unlimited, Shamal Books, Single Action Productions, or who came through a John Oliver Killens workshop or an Amiri Baraka classroom. Anyone could easily argue that the Renaissance is still with us. But the racism doesn't go away. It gets harder or slicker depending on the moment. Consider, after Baldwin and Killens had gained entry into what the racists call mainstream publishing, the large conglomerates began to fathom the net profits that could be gained by lowering their ramparts against black literature. Meanwhile, people like uh, Baraka and Sarah Wright, and more than half of the folks that I've mentioned already, had begun their public careers in the manner that most of our literature gets out there, through self and cooperative publishing. <clears throat> through which process, they not only have more control, though limited outlets, but as well begin, uh, but as well on the whims of, excuse me, but as well begin their public careers by legitimizing themselves, rather than waiting on the whims of those who would prostitute their work. As a matter of fact, the hallmark of our literary output from the mid-50s straight through to about 1972 can be best understood by looking into all three forms, mainstream publishing, self-publishing, and alternative cooperative publishing. The numbers of books, magazines, broadsides that help to feed a hungrier audience are inestimable. <clears throat> Most writers, trying to get with the major publishers. Failing that, they moved into the other directions. Many of those who did get published by white folks inadvertently helped to create a flaw, which in turn widened into an abyss. Killings called it the honeymoon period between black writer and white publisher. And that's where the flaw is. Black writer, white publisher. Once the movement of the 60s had been effectively neutralized, the attitude of the publishers changed from benign profiteering to racist rejection. That comes with the territory of where we are and who we're dealing with. But the flaw was in the response that many of our
are mainstream writers developed. Those who made it to Random House did nothing for the rest of us fledglings. Status over who published you became a coded echo. No portions of those advances went towards developing our own alternatives. Not one half of 1% of all those fees for readings and appearances, $5,000 apiece, went toward developing our own alternatives. By the time 1974 lets everyone know that the rug got pulled out from under us, a new generation came into the game slightly disappointed in many of the people they had just got through studying, but alert stalwarts they were, and they established their own outlets and cooperatives. From then on, it seemed to many of us, those who did get published by the biggies had to either betray themselves or come with a distorted sense of themselves already ingrained. Folks like Killens were no longer in vogue. You had to be anti your own family, male and female alike, in order to get past your first book, in order to latch on to that lucrative career. And what starts that process is your own peculiarly individual response to your educational experience. Knowing very little about your own past, being tricked into absorption by a schizophrenic, that's what a racist is, and allowing yourself to read only what he tells you to read to get that grade, become the groundwork that hones into you a false sense of self and a lack of a firmly rooted perspective. It's easy to fall into this trap when you refuse to question every single given. And you can always tell just by the choices of words which writers have fallen. But if you can get through that, the question becomes, who'd you study writing under? What did you do to feed that perspective? How seriously did you take your mentors and how clear were they? How crooked? How clear are you? Not just on the question of craft, but more importantly, your approach to the content, the context that you give it, and what is your overall intention towards your audience and yourself? Each of which is a highly pertinent question that distinguishes the degree to which you can make a genuine literary contribution or actually get something from what you read. And once that is done, or at least once you are armed with clarity, how are you going to get your work published? Through whom? Under what circumstances? I could easily go on for another 20 minutes to get into the details of that question, but I'd like to make it simple. While it is true, that the rate of sales are much slower and lower among the alternative presses. Your book in the hands of an African-American publisher stands a better chance of lasting out there in the market long enough to reach the best hands, our own. If you don't do it yourself, you're subject to being misused. If you don't hook up with your own, you're in deeper trouble than when you started out. If you don't support your own alternatives and learn to promote your own work, our literature and our future writers may very well suffer the consequences of oblivion. It's bad enough that alternative publishers are undernourished by grants agencies, snubbed by our own academicians, unknown to our local librarians, excluded from required and or approved reading lists, ignored or cheated by bookstores, yeah, that's bad enough. But when our writers, our readers,
not only a poet, but he's also a, a writer in his own right. He's going to read for 20 minutes, hopefully. I don't mean it as an insult to uh, uh, Lewis Reyes. I think you gave us a very brilliant uh, perspective on this whole thing.
Chestnut makes another statement a little later, once he did embark upon a uh, literary career, which was rather late. And I'm trying to find another excerpt. so we're talking nine years later, um, in which he was commenting upon the type of fiction that was currently popular in America. We're talking about uh, Thomas Nelson Page, Thomas Dixon, uh, whose thrust in terms of depicting uh, black characters in their fiction, such as the Leopard Spots, their thrust was that blacks were degenerate and dangerous. That basically was, was what their fiction was hitting at. And what they were saying was that if you educated or attempted to educate the masses of blacks, that they would cause the moral decay of America. So, of course, Chestnut railed against that also. And in his fiction, I think one of the best examples of, of, of sort of his whole concept of how uh, racism and, and the ideology surrounding it impacted on his work can be seen in his short fiction. He had a character uh, called Uncle Julius who he used in a series of what they call frame tales. Now what the frame tale is, is that it's a story inside a story. So in other words, it opens up with Uncle Julius, who was an ex-slave, and he's working, he's still working on the plantation uh, for the white owners. There's a situation, something happens, and then in the course of the situation, Uncle Julius tells a story about something he remembered from the plantation. All right, what I'm going to do is I'm going to read a little excerpt, not only that encompasses a, uh, a piece from one of the Uncle Julius tales, but it's going to shed some light on Chestnut's overall concern uh, with racism. Okay, uh, this is, these are my comments. Uh, a key step in the social conditioning of slaves was to strip them of their proper names. Uh, so the master's label could be applied. Just as Fredo was renamed Nig, and in that, in that respect I'm referring to Harry Wilson's novel, the overseer seeks to apply the demeaning tag Sambo wherever, it has, wherever he has the whim. If one considers the fireworks that occur in the 60s and even now as language, uh, Lewis is giving us, giving us some other language issues to ponder, the idea of Negro versus black and black versus Afro-American and African-American versus African United States and all that type of thing, Chestnut grasps this importance at the turn of the century in terms of what names and naming, what labeling, how important all of that is with respect to our psyches. In Deep Sleeper, which is one of the stories, the sample mentality is taken a step further. Newborn slaves are given names just as insulting and obliterating of their heritage as sample. And this is an excerpt from that story. Tom's granddaddy was named Scundis, he began. He had a brother named Tushis and another named Cottus, and another named Squinches. The old man paused a moment and gave his leg another hitch. My sister-in-law was shaking with laughter. What remarkable names, she exclaimed. Where in the world did they get them? Them names was given to them by old Mars McDougal, what I used to belong to, and they used to belong to. Mars Dougal named all the babies what was born at the plantation. These youngins mammy wanted to call them something plain and simple, like Rustus or Caesar in George Washington. But old Mars say no. He want all the niggas on this place to have different names so he can tell them apart. He done use up all the common names so he had to take something else. Chestnut, as Sylvia Lyra Renders points out, is further criticizing the systematic dehumanization that was part and parcel of slavery. For the names Uncle Julius calls are actually Secundus, Tertius, Quartus, and Quintus. These are the Latin terms for second, third, fourth, fifth. Like prisoners, though none has committed a crime, these men receive numbers as official names. They are property objects, so labeled by the master. Chestnut, no matter how entertaining the story he has Uncle Julius telling on the surface, constantly paints slavery as the inhumane system it was. Render also indicates two other implications of the naming ritual described in the above passage. 
first is the fact that all the common names are used up. That fact calls to mind the degrading practice of breeding slaves to sell, which was widespread during the mid-1800s. Second, mention of the desire of the mothers to give them the plain and simple names listed permits Chestnut to score what was the practice of many unleaded black folk and also to suggest the tragic irony of giving such names as Caesar and George Washington to individuals whom slavery would never permit to attain the eminence of the men whose names they bore. Slave relations then were reinforced by a linguistic system brought into an existence to justify them. The master had the words to assuage his own conscience, the slaves lived the lives. Moving from Chestnut forward, uh, we move up to, again, Chestnut had this whole notion of appealing. It was a moral revolution, as you heard the words earlier. Um, if, we, if we go back to that time, Chestnut, after initial burst and initial period of enthusiasm by white readership, his popularity diminished uh, radically. At the same time, a contemporary, or one whose who's, who's, uh, career at least overlaps his, Paul Lawrence Dunbar, enjoyed continued success among white readership. Part of the reason, uh, I would surmise, is that Dunbar was primarily concerned in his work with an idealized version of the American past. This was something that whites were more interested in. Chestnut was more on the edge of social change, pushing uh, for social change, uh, fairness, equity, and so forth. And I would suspect that that particular political agenda, though by no means it was, it was not a revolutionary agenda in the sense that, that we're used to hearing, but it was an agenda that the white readership of the period uh, did not care to hear. All right? Moving forward, as I, as I mentioned earlier, Richard Wright. Richard Wright was uh, one of the most important writers of the 20th century. And his work also, racism, you can't get around it when you talk about uh, African American literature, it is indeed the tale of wags and dog. Uh, Richard Wright wrote an autobiography, Black Boy, in 1945, in which he deals with his experiences growing up as a child in the South. He was born in Mississippi. He was raised traveling back and forth between Mississippi and Tennessee. And finally, at the age of about 19, he left the South for good, as a matter of fact, and journeyed to Chicago, eventually to New York, and eventually out of the country altogether, over to France, uh, never to return. He makes a statement at the close of his autobiography that I think is worth reading to you. It's very brief. The South said that it knew niggers, and I was what the white South called a nigger. Well, the white South had never known me, never known what I thought, what I felt. The white South said that I had a place in life. Well, I had never felt my place, or rather, my deepest instincts had always made me reject the place to which the white South had assigned me. It had never occurred to me that I was in any way an inferior being. And no word that I had ever heard fall from the lips of Southern white men had ever made me really doubt the worth of my own humanity. True, I had lied. I had stolen. I had struggled to contain my seething anger. I had fought. And it was perhaps a mere accident that I had never killed. But in what other ways had the South allowed me to be natural, to be real, to be myself, except in rejection? rebellion, and aggression. Not only had the Southern whites not known me, but more important still, as I had lived in the South, I had not had the chance to learn who I was. The pressure of Southern living kept me from being the kind of person that I might have been. I had been what my surroundings had demanded, what my family, conforming to the dictates of the whites above them, had exacted of me, and what the whites had said that I must be. Never being fully able to be myself, I had slowly learned that the South could recognize but a part of a man, could accept but a fragment of his personality, and all the rest, the best and deepest things of heart and mind, were tossed away in blind ignorance and hate. All right? So that was the, just, about, just about the closing statement. Matter of fact, it was part of what I consider to be the closing statement of that book. What Wright does, and the reason he's important in, in, in tracing lineage from Chestnut is that he is the first Afro-American writer to give or to present unsentimental protagonists. In Uncle Tom's Children, he presents victims of racism, but those victims are so sentimental that even 
the most conservative of whites could in some way identify with them. You see, he has someone who's caught up in, in between family and survival obligations and commits a crime or murder because of that. Almost anyone can sympathize with the extenuating circumstances. In 1940, when he gives you bigger Thomas, however, uh, unsympathetic, brute, the raw living out of native son, native son meaning what America produces in those reservations or ghettos, when he gives that unsentimental character, uh, his critical star begins to descend and has been on the ascent, descent, uh, despite his popularity among writers and artists and whatnot, it has been on the descent ever since, actually, and particularly now in this, in this, in, in this modern era. If we go along, I don't want to stay too long, I just want to sort of give you a gloss on some of the things that are happening. Uh, if we talk about essayists, um, as Mr. Rivera mentioned, I would guess that Baldwin, James Baldwin, would be the master of the tradition if we just talk about in the United States. Uh, Langston Hughes would be the master poet. Over four, almost 50 years of poetry, uh, things like Dream Deferred, uh, Life, uh, Mother to Son, some of these poems that are like household items, all of them are responses in some way or another uh, to racism. There's a, another episode that I think I will read to you. It comes from Invisible Man by Ralph Ellison. And what it deals with is there's a story in which this student was valedictorian of his class all right, in the South. And he was asked to give a speech. He was asked to deliver a speech uh, as a valedictory address. But when he came to deliver the speech before the white citizens of the town, he had to participate first in a battle royal, a demeaning battle royal, in which a battle royal, if you're familiar with the term, uh, you're blindfolded. In this particular case, they were blindfolded and they had to, they, they put a group of black boys in the ring and they had to fight each other, even though they couldn't see each other. And then when they got down to the final two, the blindfolds were removed and they just fought and the winner uh, collected the prize. Also during that ceremony, uh, Coins were tossed on the rug, and the boys were told to get the, uh, you know, to get the money. When they got the money, of course, the rug was, was, was electric, and they were shocked. But all kinds of mean things were done. Anyway, this young, young hero, so to speak, he persevered through all of that. Finally, gave his speech, and the white folks commended him on it. Said it was a fine speech, and he was going to be a proper and uh, upright Negro one day, who would be a credit to his race, of course. But when he went home that night, he had a dream. He couldn't forget about his grandfather. It was very funny. Not funny, but tragic comic. That night, I dreamed I was at a circus with him and that he refused to laugh at the clowns no matter what they did. Then later, he told me to open my briefcase and read what was inside, and I did, finding an official envelope stamped with the state seal. And inside the envelope, I found another and another endlessly, and I thought I would fall of weariness. Them years, he said, and I opened that one, and I did, and ended up found an engraved document containing a short message in letters of gold. Read it, my grandfather said out loud, and the protagonist read it. To whom it may concern, I intone, keep this nigger boy running. And so we proceed with, uh, from Chestnut through Wright, through Baldwin, through Ellison, through Hughes, on up into the 60s, and those early responses to racism inspired a generation of writers who came to the forefront in the 60s. And what I'm going to do is simply conclude with a, I'm going to read some of the preface from an anthology that I found, not that I was looking for it in particular, but I found it, so I said I may as well use it. And it's called Black Arts and Anthology of Black Creations. And what I'm going to do is, I'll just read the preface, which was written by uh, Carol Potsy Caldestilli, and what it does is sort of outlines the agenda that writers had adopted uh, by the end of the 60s. Mari Evans, the echo of whose voice you should seek in the depths of your spirit, has said, the beauty of blackness is not how many honkies and honky businesses you can rip off, but how many black men you can support and build up. This anthology is one of our many attempts at self-examination, a process of building up and self-assertion, an aspect of support. 
These creations attempt to capture the mood, the spirit of a people engaged in liberatory struggle. Some of these brothers and sisters can also shoot a gun or fix a righteous cocktail. Our time, our survival reality demands that of us, and no respect for any artist who will not put his creative talent and ability to work in the street along with the people. Remember that both Agostino Neto heading the Angola armed struggle and Ho Chi Minh are capable poets. And the poet also should know how to lead an attack, Ho Chi Minh has said. What you're about to look at and into is informed and molded by the grasp and caress of the energy that issues from love and care, both collective and personal. The authentic energy that informs our sense of mission, the creative vision probing and exploring that reservoir of energy in us. We start off where the silence is, the silence of the moment of inattention or peace, the point where death and birth or destruction and construction meet and follow the line of the rhythm of another beginning. We explore these beginnings from the silence to the sounds that punctuate that silence. See what happens to the monster in Ron Milner's The Monster and move on. Or witness the silences that Mau Mau broke in Kenya or the cultural revolutions in Guyana. The solid coil that unifies the products of creative activity in this anthology is the force, the spirit that mothers this activity. Black power to black people is the call to action in every self-respecting sector of the black world today. And there is no room for the so-called alienated or alienating artists. Talking about the sentiments of some of the poets represented in this anthology, I've said before, these are transitional men and women moving to the elemental rhythms of our time. Transitional because they are trying in our time through their rhythms to denigrify us, to bathe our pulse in revolutionary passions. Attempting, as Leroy Jones would sing, to look into black skulls and teach white people about their, white, teach white people their death. But before one can be most effectively instrumental in freeing a people, he must first himself be free. So that he strives to assert and live up to what he has and his possibilities, not what he in frustration desires to have. One looks forward to a period when the majority of these young poets abandon mannerism get directly involved in very concrete community action. When the state of black desire becomes an everyday act to satisfy that desire and split the skies with human and humanistic possibilities, they will be free then like their rhythms. And so will the rest of us, the rhythms coming directly from the way we live. We're getting there. The creations in this book do not really need an introduction since the call of their own voices is clear enough. Th these are more paths to the future. Check them out and live and be one of our brothers and sisters in the thrush of the Guyana Cultural Revolution who clearly know that the cultural aspect of a people's revolution will bring us new strength of personality by linking together our yesterdays and our tomorrows. I'll conclude there. Thank you. to me, 
all of a sudden I would find myself in the situation of being told by my black brothers and sisters that I have done that, I can only do that because I sold out to the white publisher. I think we have to be a little careful about how we look at our successful writers. And I think we have to understand that that is what we want for all our writers. We want the, their works to be really publicized and to be available at all ends of this country and all ends of this world. And we want them to get rewarded for it. I certainly want that, and I know all writers want it. I don't care whether they tell you so or not. And I think we are treading on some really unsafe ground when we begin to wonder whether they have in fact sold out to the white publisher to do that. Now the truth of the matter is just this, that you are not going to be successful financially. You are not going to be available to a white audience, a wide audience. That is to say you are not going to be distributed unless you are sold by one of the major publishing houses. That is, unfortunately, realistically, the truth. So that a black writer who becomes, who, who in the end will become available to you, and that will in the end be financially successful, will turn out to be published by a white publisher and a major publishing house. I want to tell you two things that were in the back of my mind as a writer. First, I've always wanted to be a writer ever since I knew myself. I just took a long time to do it because, one, I thought this is something that great people do and it was something I just couldn't do. I mean, how can you put words in print, words from your brain that you made up out of the air and it was actually printed and other people will read it. You know, it was a fantasy I thought never available to me. And second, I had to eat and shelter myself. So I went about an academic life to get the qualifications to eat. And once I got in an academic life, I realized that I could only, I, I was still not in a good position because I had to secure that life through what we call in academia tenure. And in order to achieve that, one had to pursue other academic interests. And finally, after many years getting that security, I then let loose and do what I wanted to do in the first place. I want to say back to the question that I had, what are the things that influenced me you know, that I, in, in writing. And one of the people who influenced me happens to be sitting on this panel, and he probably will hardly suspect that I will call his name, but I will, and that's Steve Cannon. One day, many, many years ago, when I took a year off from work, and I said, this is what I want to do, I want to write. I was sitting down there with a blank page and nothing was coming. And I called Steve and I said, Steve, tell me, how can I, you know, how, how can I get this to be interesting? It happened to be around 2 in the afternoon. He said, Elizabeth, go turn on your TV and watch the soap opera. I don't usually look at soap opera. I don't at all. And I looked at it, and I got hooked. I looked at two or three soap operas, one after the other. And I got hooked. And I understood what Steve Cannon was saying to me. And what he was saying to me is, if you're going to write, you're going to have to write something that is entertaining that is going to be interesting to a lot of people. That's what the writer is going to have to do. And I think that the black writers are going to have to be sure that they in fact do that. That they do in fact write the kind of literature that is one entertaining. Because I'm going to tell you something about publishing. It's about business. That is what it's about. Those owners of those publishing houses probably don't read the books that they publish. They probably don't care one darn about the books they publish. What they care about are the dollars that the books bring in. So it's a matter for them of making money. So what Steve Cannon was saying to me, when you get to write, Elizabeth, you write something that's going to be entertaining and interesting to a lot of people. Now, he wasn't telling me here about my culture and my heritage. That I learned from someone else. I learned that from John Oliver Killings. He says, yes, you write something interesting, and in fact, John Oliver Killens repeated what Steve Cannon said to me, and that is to say, he said, you must make the reader want to turn the page. If whatever you write has the reader saying, you know, my teacher told me to read it, or it's the, the best booksellers list, so I better read it, or somebody's going to talk about it, so I'm going to read it, then you're not writing well. 
If what happens is the reader cannot put down the book, haven't you read books like that? You have a lot of things to do. You can't put down the book. So that's what John Killen says. He agreed with what Steve Cannon said to me. Not that soap operas do in fact do that, but somehow they, they somehow change us into making these, you know, you go to the supermarket, people talk about these people and I want to know who they're talking about. They're talking about people on TV, it's not like they're real, you know. So yes, John says, turn, make them turn the page, but he added something else. And he talked about my responsibility as a writer and my responsibility as a black writer. And he had said something that both Dr. Gilliard and Luis Rivera said, in where they talked about the writer in terms of the warrior image, the writer in terms of a fighter, the writer in terms of a change agent. Yes, we have that other piece, and I assume that piece, and I think all of us here on this platform assume that. And that is to say, whereas we want to make money, it is not at any expense. It is not, we want to, we do not want to prostitute our art, nor write propaganda. We have an agenda, and that agenda is to write responsibly so that we promote, we promote our heritage, we promote our people, we say some truths about our people. Now, I want to talk a little bit about those truths we say about people, about ourselves. Do not tell me as a writer that there are some truths I cannot say. Do not tell me as a woman writer, when I tell you I want to write a story about the black men in my life who have made it real tough for me to make it to the top, that I can't write that story because you're concerned about what white people are going to say about black people when they read my story. I have a real problem with that. A real problem. You see, because that's my reality. Now, I do understand I have to do so responsibly. And I do understand that if I turn out and I write a book in which all the male characters are little bastards, excuse the expression, and white beaters <laughs> and so on, there's a little something that you may wonder about me. You may wonder that, you know, if I'm a little distorted myself. On the other hand, if I turn around and write a story in which the males bring home the bacon, take care of the children, give me some time to go off and do my business, a real family man, you may say, hmm, I would like to meet a man like that. I would like to meet a man like that personally, myself. All of us would. <laughs> so there are two sides of that coin, you see? And I think that we have to be real careful about that. Um, you know, as, as, as we view this whole question of racism and as we view what is, the, what is it the black writer is going to do. And I think that we talk about doing it responsibly but we talk about also doing, we are, in, we are in the business of an art. We are in the business of a money-making business. We are in the business of being responsible, responsibly projecting our people. And we have to do, in fact, all of those. But I, I think that propaganda works in a lot, in, in both ways. Either you can say too positively about something or too negatively uh, about something in, in either way. So that eventually, uh, what I would say is that one cannot deny that there is, in fact, uh, racism in publishing. And it is not, in fact, difficult for a black writer to get published. And to get back a little bit on what Doris Jean Austin said, the part of the problem has to do with what publishers, publishers would say to you. And that is that, namely, there is no audience for the books. They would say to you, well, listen, I like your book, I'm going to publish it. I'm going to run 2,000 copies of your book. Now, that's not a run at all of a book. I mean, that's no run of a book. 2,000 copies for the whole world, you know that's no, no run. I'll run 2,000 copies of your book. It's a tax write-off. And you say to them, well, why can't you run 100,000 like you ran for Mrs. X or so on? And they say, because they're black, there is no audience for the book. Black people aren't writing. You see, sometimes the black writer finds themselves in the position of saying, well, there are black people reading my book. But then, if the book isn't sold, if the book returns to the publishing house, if the book is shredded, do you know how many black writers that happens to? Can I tell you? Can I tell you how many black writers that are my personal friends who live the, the embarrassment of knowing that they only published 5,000 copies of their book and 3,000 copies were shredded? Do you know how that hurts a writer? They keep it as a secret. They don't tell anybody that. You know what I did? 
I bought 200 copies of my book, and they're in my basement, because I won't have them shred my book. And if they write to me and tell me they have a thousand more and they're going to shred it, I'll find the money and buy that thousand and keep it in my basement. But some people, are in, for one reason or the other, not in that position. You know what that feels like to get your book shredded? Real, it's real bad. It takes you years and a lot of time, a lot of sacrifice. Uh, as has been said before, that there's a connection between money and time for a writer. If you have to work, you don't have time to write. See? And when you find that time to write, it's at a great expense. Nobody's buying a book and then the publisher says, I told you so. Don't come with a second novel to me. I just had to shred 3,000 copies of your book. So what Joris Jean Austin is saying is real. It's a fact. No question about it. Now the second part of it is black writers get criticized. Well, they only bought your book because you're telling the story they want to hear. Well, let me tell you something. When I went to see The Color Purple in Green Acres Mall, I had to wait for two showings before I get to the, got to the third showing to get to see that movie. And the audience was totally black. It was not white. So who are the they that liked The Color Purple so that they only bought that book because it was selling to what white people wanted? Tell me, let's talk the truth here. Let's talk the truth. The audiences for the Color Purple movie are black, they're not white. Some white people went to see it, but you looked at the lines around the cinemas and they were black. So, if you got a problem with saying that, the only reason Alice Walker got rich, and the only reason that her, her movie sold and her book sold is because she was selling a message that white people like to hear, then a lot of black people I was looking at look, were white. You understand what I'm saying? I want to say something else. I didn't like what Luis Rivera said about some things. And I know we have a point in which we are going to refute each other's argument, but I'm going to take a chance to just say one thing since I'm on a roll on Alice Walker. Right. And that is the point, that when the black writer gets to the top and makes it with Random House and whatever, have you, that the white, black writer doesn't turn around and help the others. Well, I want you to know that Alice Walker has a publishing press. She does have one. And a publishing press publishes writers who do not have any chance of getting published anywhere. So she is giving back. And I don't think she is the only one. And I wanted you to know something else. When writers such as Doris Jean Austin, myself, Arthur Flowers, Terry McMillan, manage to get into those so-called white, quote-unquote, publishing houses, don't just think because we're in that publishing house, we can turn around and do a lot of other things for what Luis Rivera called fledgling writers. Because we are struggling in those publishing houses. We are not having such a good time. We are being patronized in those publishing houses. I've just finished writing my second novel, and I got the good news not too long ago that they like it, and so most likely it will come out. But I'll tell you something about the first time the first novel was published. Johnny Williams said to me, why are you all talking on the stage while I'm talking? <laughs> I mean, I mean, really. <laughs> the first, <laughs> I'm going to shut up just now, you know. The first time that uh, my novel was published, you know, I got all excited and stuff, you know. I'm in Putnam, and, and as a matter of fact, Valentine of Random House wanted to get the paperback rights. I mean, I'm real hot. I'm really doing good. And John A. Williams calls me and he said, Elizabeth, I want to cool you down a little bit. You know who John A. Williams is? You know who he is, the novelist? Let's get some novels by John A. Williams, Steve. Some more. He's read about six or seven. <laughs> the Bachelor Party. This is a big writer I'm talking about. Big writer called a little me. And he said, Elizabeth, I want to tell you something. Don't get all excited. I want you to get ready for the fall. They're not going to do anything for you, Elizabeth. For me, of course they're going to do something. Women are selling. I'm a black woman. Big partner. Big Valentine. They're going to do something for me, yeah. He says, oh no. He says, hey, man, just envious. You know, black man, male writers, women writers. You know, he's got a problem. But you know what? He told me the God truth. Every line that he said to me was the truth. And you see, when you hit that ground, when you know you spent five years writing a, a book, 
And you know, you didn't go to a, a, a small publishing house. You went to the big times. And nothing happens when you hit the ground. It takes a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of ego and a lot of support from your other colleagues to say, I'm going to try again. I'm going to do it again. So I did it again. And they tell me one more time that they like my book again. But this time, I'm coming in a little worse. I'm going to say to them, the only way you're going to get my book is if you pay me a lot of money. You know why? Because if you pay me a lot of money, you're going to try to get back that money. And for you to get back that money, you're going to publicize that money. So this time, I'm, I'm not going to be cheap with my work. You're not going to, I don't want to be published that badly. I want to be published that badly. I'll tell you the truth, I do. <laughs> but I'm going to tell them, I don't want to be published. You're going to have to pay me a lot of money for my book. Because then you're going to do something. So what I want to say is, what else do I want to say in conclusion? Really, what I want to say is, <laughs> in my two seconds, what I want to say is that I, I want us to have a little balance here. I want us to say, let us be, uh, be kinder to those of us black writers who have indeed succeeded. Let us, let us, let us, let us be, a, be a little more, let us question a little more the premise we seem to take just offhanded that these people, the only way they got on the top is by betraying themselves or selling out to white publishers. Let's ask ourselves exactly what we mean by that. I mean, why do we have a problem with some of us making it to the top? And then let us also ask, let us also ask the other question that, well, they only, they, the publishers are only buying what it is white people want to hear. Let's ask that. Let's just look a little more introspectively into that question because maybe it's what we want to hear too. Because maybe if we wanted to hear something else, we'll support another book, you know? Uh, and then let us also say that something I believe, and, and maybe nobody here in this group here would believe, I sincerely believe that if you are a good writer and you have written a good book, you will get published. And you know why I believe that? I believe that because I do not believe the publishers actually, and it's gonna sound contradictory. I believe that because publishers are really interested in making money, you know, in a sense. And that a good book, and I don't want anyone to go around to feel, you know, that there's all sorts of racism in the country and therefore, which is, we know is a reality, we can't escape it. And therefore, it's so difficult that we'll write or whatever it is. I'm going to say to you, if you're a good writer, or you want to write, you go right ahead and you write. And probably write from, I would think that the advice I got from Steve Cannon and from Johnny Killins, which I shared with you, probably are two good guides.